Welcome to a half hour of Mind Webs. Short stories from the worlds of speculative fiction. This story comes from the June 1961 issue of Galaxy. It's Paul Anderson's My Object, All Sublime. We met in line of business. Michael's firm wanted to start a subdivision on the far side of Evanston and discovered that I held title to some of the most promising acreage. They made me a good offer, but I was stubborn. They raised it, and I stayed stubborn. And finally, the boss himself looked me up. He wasn't entirely what I'd expected. Aggressive, of course, but in so polite a way that it didn't offend his manner so urbane you rarely noticed his lack of formal education, which lack he was remedying quite fast anyhow via night classes and extension courses, as well as omnivorous reading. We went out for a drink while we talked the matter over. It led me to a bar that had little of Chicago about it, quiet, shabby, no jukebox, no television, a bookshelf and several chess sets, but none of the freaks and phonies who usually infest such places. Besides ourselves, there were only a half a dozen customers, a professor emeritus type among the books, some people arguing politics with a degree of factual relevancy, a young man debating with a bartender whether Bartok was more original than Schoenberg, or vice versa. And Michaels and I found a corner table and some Danish beer. I explained I didn't care about money one way or another, but objected to bulldozing some rather good-looking countryside in order to erect still another chrome-plated slum. Michael stuffed his pipe before answering. He was a lean, erect man, long-chinned and Roman-nosed. His hair grizzled, his eyes dark and luminous. Didn't my representative explain, he said. We aren't planning a row of identical split-level sites. We have six basic designs in mind with variations to be located in the pattern, like so. He took out pencil and paper and began to sketch. As he talked, he made his own case better than anyone had done for him. Like it or not, he said, this was the middle 20th century, and mass production was here to stay. A community need not be less attractive for being ready-made, could in fact gain an artistic unity. He proceeded to show me how. He didn't press me too hard, and conversation wandered. Oh, a delightful spot, this, I told him. How'd you find it? He shrugged. Oh, I often prowl about, especially at night, exploring. Isn't that rather dangerous? Well, not in comparison, he said with a touch of grimness. Uh, I, uh, I gather you weren't born over here. No, no, I, I didn't arrive in the United States till 1946, in what they called a DP, a displaced person. I became Thad Michaels because I got tired of spelling out Tadeusz Michalowski. Nor did I want any part of old country sentimentalism. I'm uh, really a zealous assimilationalist. Otherwise, he seldom talked very much about himself. Later, I got some details of his early rise in business from admiring and envious competitors. Some of them didn't yet believe it was possible to sell a house with radiant heating for less than $20,000 and show a profit. Michaels had found ways to make it possible. Not bad for a penniless immigrant. I checked up and found he'd been admitted on a special visa in consideration of services rendered the U.S. Army in the last stages of the European War. Those services had taken nerve as well as quick-wittedness. Meanwhile, our acquaintance developed. I sold him the land he wanted, but we continued to see each other, sometimes in the tavern, sometimes at my bachelor apartment, most often in his lakeshore penthouse. He had a stunning blonde wife and a couple of bright, well-mannered boys. Nonetheless, he was a lonely man, and I fulfilled his need for friendship. It was a year or so after we first met that he told me the story. I'd been invited over for Thanksgiving dinner. Afterward, we sat around and talked and talked and talked. When we had ranged from the chances of an upset in the next city election to the chances of other planets following the same general course of history as our own, Emily excused herself and went to bed. This was long past midnight. Michaels and I kept on talking. I hadn't seen him so excited before. It was as if that last subject or some particular word had opened the door for him. Finally, he got up, refilled our whiskey glasses with a motion not altogether steady, and walked across the living room, noiseless on that deep green carpet, to the picture window. 
The night was clear and sharp. We overlooked the city, streaks and webs and coils of glittering color, ruby, amethyst, emerald, topaz, and the dark sheet of Lake Michigan. Almost it seemed we could glimpse endless white plains beyond. But overhead arched the sky, crystal black, where the great bear stood on his tail, and Orion went striding along the Milky Way. I hadn't often seen so big and frosty a view. And he said, Well, after all, I know what I'm talking about. I stirred deep in my armchair. Only one shaded lamp lit the room so that the star swarms had also been visible to me when I passed by the window earlier. I jibed a little. Uh, personally? And he glanced back toward me, his face stiff. What would you say if I answered yes? I sipped my drink. King's Ransom is a noble and comforting brew, most especially when the earth itself seems to tone with a deepening chill. I suppose you had your reasons. Well, wait to see what they are. He grinned one-sidedly. Oh, well, I, I'm from this planet, too. Uh, and yet, yet the sky is so wide and strange. Don't you think the strangeness would affect men who, you know, who went there? Wouldn't it seep into them? So they carried it back in their bones? And Earth was never quite the same afterward? Well, go on. You know I like fantasies. He stared outward and then back again, and suddenly he tossed off his drink. The violent gesture was unlike him, but so had his hesitation been. And he said in a harsh tone, Okay, then. Okay, I'll tell you a fantasy. It's a story for winter. It's a cold story that you are best advised not to take so serious. I drew on the excellent cigar he'd given me and waited in the silence he needed. He paced a few times back and forth before the window, eyes to the floor, until he filled his glass anew and sat down near me. He didn't look at me, but a picture on the wall, a somber, unintelligible thing which no one else liked. He seemed to get strength from it, for he began talking, fast and softly. Once upon a time, a very, very long time in the future, there was a civilization. I shall not describe it to you, for, well, it'd be impossible. Could you go back to the time of the Egyptian pyramid builders and tell them about this city below us? I don't mean they wouldn't believe you. Of course they wouldn't, but that hardly matters. I, I mean, they, they would not understand. So nothing you said could make sense to them. And the way people work and think and believe would be, well, less comprehensible than those lights and towers and machines. Not so? If I spoke to you of people in the future living among great blinding energies and of genetic changelings and imaginary wars and talking stones and a certain blind hunter, well, you might feel anything at all, but you would not understand... So, I ask you only to imagine how many thousands of times this planet has circled the sun, and how deeply buried and forgotten we are. And then also to imagine that this other civilization thinks in patterns so foreign that it has ignored every limitation of logic and natural law to discover means of traveling in time. So, while the ordinary dweller in that age, I can't exactly call him a citizen or anything else for which we have a word because it would be too misleading, the average educated dweller knows in a vague, uninterested way that millennia ago, some semi-savages were the first to split the atom. Only one or two men have actually been here, walked among us, studied in Naptus, and returned with a file of information for the central brain, if I might call it by such a name. No one else is concerned with us any more than you are concerned with early Mesopotamian archaeology. You see? He dropped his gaze to the tumbler in his hand and held it there as if the whiskey were an oracular pool. The silence grew. At last I said, Oh, very well. For the sake of the story, I'll, uh, I'll accept the premise. I imagine time travelers would be unnoticeable. They'd have their own techniques of disguise and so on. Wouldn't want to change their own past. And he said, Oh, oh there, there's no danger of that. It's only that they couldn't learn much if they went around insisting they were from the future. Just imagine. I chuckled. Michaels gave me a shadowed look. Apart from the scientific, can you guess what use there, there might be for time travel? Well, 
trade in objects of art or or natural resources, I suppose. Go back to the dinosaur age and dig up iron before man appeared to uh, strip the richest mines. And he shook his head. Well, think again. See, they'd only want a limited number of Minoan statuettes, Ming vases, or third-world hegemony dwarfs, chiefly for their museums. If museum isn't too inaccurate a word. I tell you, they are not like us. As for natural resources, they're beyond the point of needing any. They, they make their own. He paused as if before a final plunge, then... What was this uh, penal colony the French abandoned? Devil's Island? Yeah, yeah, that was it. Can you imagine a better revenge on a condemned criminal than to maroon him in the past? Why, I should think they'd be above any concept of revenge or even of deterrence by horrible examples. Even in this century, we're aware that that doesn't work, are we? Are you sure? Side by side with the growth of today's enlightened penology, haven't we seen a corresponding growth of crime itself? Now, you were wondering some time ago how I dared walk the night streets alone, remember? And furthermore, punishment is a catharsis of society as a whole. Up in the future, they'd tell you that public hangings did reduce the crime rate, which would otherwise have been still higher. And somewhat more important, these spectacles made possible the 18th century birth of real humanitarianism. He raised a sardonic brow. Or so they claim in the future. It doesn't matter whether they're right or merely rationalizing the degraded element in their own civilization. All you need assume is that they do send their very worst criminals back into the past. Well, that's rather rough on the past, isn't it? No, no, not really, for a number of reasons, including the fact that everything they caused to happen has already happened. <laughs> Damn, English just isn't built for talking about these paradoxes. And mainly, though, you have to remember that they don't waste all this effort on ordinary miscreants. And one has to be a very rare criminal to deserve of exile and time. And the worst crime in the world depends on the particular year of the world's history. Murder, brigandage, treason, heresy, narcotics, peddling, slaving, patriotism. Really, the whole catalog. All have rated capital punishment in some epochs. And have all been lightly regarded in others. And positively commended in still others. Now, think back and see if I'm not right. I regarded him for a while, observing how deep the lines were in his face and recalling that at his age he shouldn't be so gray. I said, Well, very well agreed, but would not a man from the future possessing all its knowledge... He set his glass down with audible force. What knowledge? Use your brains. Imagine yourself left naked and alone in Babylon. Now, how much Babylonian language or history do you know? Who's the present king? How much longer will he reign? Who will succeed him? What are the laws and customs you must obey? <laughs> you remember that eventually the Assyrians or the Persians or someone will conquer Babylon and there'll be hell to pay. But when and how? Is a current war a, well, a mere border skirmish or an all-out struggle? If it's the latter, is Babylon going to win? If not, what peace terms will be imposed? Yeah, there wouldn't be 20 men today who could answer those questions without looking up the answers in the book, and you're not one of them. Nor have you been given a book. Well, I think I'd uh, I'd head for the nearest temple once I'd picked up enough of the language. and Well, I'd uh, tell the priest I could make uh, uh, fireworks. And he laughed with small merriment. <laughs> How? You're in Babylon, remember? Where do you find sulfur? Where do you find saltpeter? If you can get across to the priest what you want and somehow persuade him to obtain the stuff for you, how do you compound a powder that'll, you know, actually go off instead of just fizzing? For your information, that's quite an art. Hell, you couldn't even get a berth as a deckhand. You'd be lucky if you ended up scrubbing floors. In fact, a slave in the field's a likelier career, isn't it? And the fire sank low. And I conceded. Yeah, all right, I, I guess that's true. They pick the era with special care, you know. He looked back toward the window. Seen from our chairs, reflection on the glass blotted out the stars so that we were only aware of the night itself. When a man is sentenced to banishment, all the experts confer, pointing out what the periods of their specialties would be like for this particular individual. 
You might see how a squeamish intellectual type dropped into Homeric Greece would find it a living nightmare. Whereas a rowdy type might, might get along pretty well. Might even end up a respected warrior. Now, if the rowdy was not the blackest of criminals, they might actually leave him near the hall of Agamemnon, condemning him to no more than danger, discomfort, and homesickness. Oh, my God, the, the homesickness. So much darkness rose in him as he spoke that I sought to steady him with a dry remark. Well, we must immunize the convict every ancient disease, otherwise this would be only an elaborate death sentence, right? His eyes focused on me again. Yes, and of course the longevity serum is still active in his veins. That's all, however. He's dropped in an unfrequented spot after dark, the machine vanishes, and he's cut off for the rest of his life. All he knows is that they've chosen an era for him with such characteristics that they expect the, the punishment will fit his crime. Stillness fell once more upon us until the clock on the mantel became the loudest thing in the world, as if all other sound had frozen to death outside. I glanced at his dial. The night was old. Soon the east would be turning pale. And when I looked back, he was still watching me, disconcertingly, intent, and I asked him, What was your crime? He didn't seem taken aback. Only said wearily, mm, What does it matter? I told you the crimes of one age are the heroisms of another. If my attempt had succeeded, the centuries to come would have adored my name. But I failed. A lot of people must have got hurt. A whole world must have hated you. Well, yes, this is a fantasy I'm telling you, of course, you know, to pass the time. I smiled and said, and I'm playing along with you. His tension eased a trifle, he leaned back. His legs stretched across that glorious carpet. So, um, given as much of the fantasies I've related... How did you deduce the extent of my uh, alleged guilt? Well, it was your, your past life. <laughs> when and where were you left? He said in as bleak a voice as I've ever heard. Near, near Warsaw in August 1939. I don't imagine you uh, care to talk about the war years. No, no, I don't. However, he went on when enough defiance had accumulated. My enemies blundered. The confusion following the German attack gave me a chance to escape from police custody before I could be stuck in a concentration camp. And gradually, I, I learned what the situation was. Of course, I, I couldn't predict anything. I, I still can't. Only specialists know or, or care what happened in the 20th century. But by the time I'd become a Polish conscript in the German forces, I... I realized this was the losing side. So I slipped across to the Americans, told them what I had observed, and became a scout for them. Risky, but if I'd stopped a bullet, what the hell? I didn't, and I ended up with plenty of sponsors to get me over here, and the rest of my story is conventional. My cigar had gone out, and I relit it. Four cigars that Michaels had were not to be taken casually. He had them especially flown from Amsterdam. And I said, the alien corn. What? You know, Ruth and Ruth in exile. She wasn't badly treated, but she stood weeping for her homeland. No, I, I don't know that story. It's in the Bible. Ah, uh, yes, I, I really must read the Bible sometime. His mood was changing by the moment toward the assurance I had first encountered. He swallowed his whiskey with a gesture almost debonair. His expression was alert and confident. And he said, Yes, that, that aspect was pretty bad. Not, not so much the physical conditions of life. You'd doubtless gone camping and noticed how soon you stopped missing hot running water, electric lights, and all the gadgets that the manufacturers assure us are absolute necessities. I'd be glad enough of a gravity reducer or a cell stimulator if I had one, but I'd get along fine without them. The homesickness, though, that's what really eats you. Little things you never notice. Some particular food, the way people walk, the games played, the small talk topics, even the constellations. 
They're different in the future. The sun has traveled that far in its galactic orbit. But, voluntary or forced, people have always been emigrating. We're all descended from those who could stand the shock. I adapted. But uh, I wouldn't go back now even if I were given a free pardon. Mm, not the way those traitors are running things. I finished my own drink, tasting it with my whole tongue and palate, for it was a marvelous whiskey. And I listened to him with only half an ear. Mm, you like it here? Yeah. Yeah, by now I do. I'm, I'm over the emotional hump, being so busy the first few years, just, just staying alive. And then so busy establishing myself after I came to this country. That helped. I never had much time for self-pity. Now my business interests me more and more. It's a fascinating game, pleasantly free of extreme penalties for wrong moves. I've discovered qualities here that the future has lost. I, I bet you have no idea how exotic this city is. Now think, at this moment, within five miles of us, there's a soldier on guard at uh, an atomic laboratory, there's a bomb freezing in the doorway, an orgy in a millionaire's apartment... A priest making ready for sunrise rites, a merchant from Araby, a spy from Muscovy, a ship from the Indies. His excitement softened. He looked from the window and the night inward toward the bedrooms. And, and my wife and kids. No. No, I, I wouldn't go back no matter what happened. I took a final breath from my cigar. Yeah, you have done rather well. Liberated from his gray mood, he grinned at me. You know, you know, I think you believe that yarn I told you. I stubbed out the cigar, rose, and stretched. Oh, oh, I do, I, I do believe you. Michaels, the hour is late, and we better be going. He didn't notice at once. When he did, he came out of his chair like a big cat. We? Of course. I drew a nerve gun from my pocket. He stopped in his tracks. This sort of thing isn't left to chance. We check up. Come along now. The blood drained from his face. No, 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 you can't. It isn't fair. Not to Emily, the children. And I told him, that is part of the punishment. And I left him in Damascus the year before Tamerlane sacked it. That story was My Object All Sublime, written by Paul Anderson. It appeared in the June 1961 issue of Galaxy. This is Michael Hansen speaking, engineering for Mindwebs by Steve Gordon. Mindwebs is produced at WHA Radio in Madison, a service of University of Wisconsin Extension.
Thank you.